Okay, so now we're, uh, I think, uh, well, when this presentation is done, we're going to go to a debate format, so I'm going to take a few minutes uh, to state the case for uh, gold as money, and then Roman will state the case for Bitcoin as money, and then we'll have two rounds of rebuttal, and then lunch. Uh, so, um, uh, let's talk about gold uh, a little bit, and why it's um, the best form of money. And I would certainly agree that Anything can be money uh, at various times, various places. Uh, feathers have been money, clamshells have been money. Um, so I don't, I don't doubt that Bitcoin is money. I don't, I don't dispute the fact that Bitcoin is a, is a kind of money. And Roman gave the three part definition, said maybe we're two and a half <coughs> parts to a uh, three toward satisfying that. But I'll give Bitcoin the benefit of the doubt, so it'll, it'll get to all three. But, but let's uh, we'll come back in, that, in the next round. We'll just talk about gold a little bit. Um, the first thing about gold, it's important to understand, it is genuinely scarce. Uh, you know, you've probably heard of what are called rare earths. Rare earths are special uh, minerals that are used in various technological applications. They're uh, found in very low density, uh, different places around the earth. Well, gold is far more rare than rare earths. Rare earths are actually plentiful. The reason they're called rare earths is because the amount of ore you have to dig up to get a little bit of it is huge. They're, they're, they're scarcely uh, thinly distributed, but they're actually around with different quantities. Whereas gold is, is genuinely scarce. But the entire effort of the mining industry on a worldwide basis, and that, that effort has been extensive the last uh, 10 years because the price of gold has gone up so much. I should say the dollar price of gold has gone up so much in the last 10 years. Um, all that output adds about one and a half percent to the stock every year. So it's estimated there are about 165,000 tons of gold in the world. So that goes up about one and a half percent a year. So really just um, uh, uh, you know, just a few thousand tons, about uh, two, two to three thousand tons every year. Um, that's important because the economy is growing at a certain pace and if gold were everywhere, uh, it would be very unstable as a store of value. It, the dollar price of gold would be a lot more volatile. Um, it wouldn't be very valuable as a store of wealth. That's one of the three-part definition. But that, that scarcity is, uh, is very important. And actually, there's a feedback loop between production and scarcity. People say, well, what about the California gold rush of 1849? A lot of gold came into the market all at once, and that's true. And there were some major discoveries in the, in the late 19th century. But what happens is that when you have that much gold coming on the market, quickly, and that has been rare throughout history, it has happened, but it's, it's very rare, it causes inflation. If gold is money, and you put a lot of money in the system quickly, you do get an uh, inflationary uh, spike, which makes the money um, you know, temporarily less, va less valuable, uh, but then you get into periods of scarcity. So, that, so then what happens is your mining costs go up because of inflation, mining becomes less profitable, mining slows down. The, the converse is true in periods where of, of deflation, where, where gold is, is more valuable, that attracts more people to mining. Uh, you know, they say that uh, imitation is the sincerest form of flattery. I think it's interesting that in the Bitcoin world, they've actually used the term mining uh, to describe what's going on. A lot of Bitcoin was patterned on gold in the sense that it was going to be scarce. These Bitcoins can only be created at a very slow pace. You need more and more computing power uh, to produce them. That's exactly like the capital investment that goes into mining to produce gold. So they were the Bitcoin creators were consciously imitating gold and gold production, gold mining to to create what they've done. Um, second thing about gold, it's an it's an element. It's atomic number seventy nine. Gold is gold. Uh, it's not anything else. So you look at other commodities because people say, well, gee, couldn't you have an oil standard or couldn't you have a grain standard or a corn or wheat standard, etc. The answer is you could. Uh, but those things all come in various grades. I mean, oil, you know, we talk about West Texas and Brandon's benchmark prices, but there are actually 70 or 80 major grades of oil around the world, depending <coughs> on viscosity and sulfur content and, and other variables. Same thing with uh, corn, if you trade corn futures um, and the Chicago futures market. They have very detailed specifications about what kind of corn you're allowed to deliver. And it can't have certain impurities and et cetera. That's not a problem with gold. It's an element. It is what it is. Uh, so there's no such thing as near gold or corrupt gold or pseudo gold. I mean, you can make you can make 14 karat gold, but that just means you put an alloy in. It's not all gold. So that uniformity is is very important. 
Um, gold has very, to talk really about the reasons why it's money good, uh, has very high density. If you've ever held a gold coin or a gold bar in your hand, the first thing that you notice is it's heavy. So when it puts a gold coin in your hand, about it weighs, weighs a lot. Well, it does. Um, I, I happen to uh, pick up a, a 400 ounce bar recently. I was in Switzerland a couple of weeks ago, and it's have a picture of me smiling, but we don't see the pictures. I was straining to hold it up. It's 20, it's like a 25 pound free weight, just a small 400 ounce bar. So it has that density, which means you get a lot of value for the weight. It's scarce, dense, pure. Uh, it's malleable. Gold is very easy to work with. So if you want to coin it or shape it or uh, turn it into uh, uh, valuable objects, that's that's fairly easy to do. Um, people talk about the industrial uses of gold. I, I say there aren't any. There are some. Uh, they, they use it to coat space helmets and they use it in certain electronic applications. And people, uh, official statistics count jewelry as um, a, a different use of gold than money, but I dispute that. To me, jewelry is just money that you wear. Uh, and you go to India and you look at the gold necklaces, it's very pretty, uh, it's attractive, but that's really the wealth and net worth of the individual that happens to be worn kind of decoratively around their neck, same thing with a watch or, or a bracelet and so forth. Um, so it has these, uh, has these characteristics, you know, uniformity, density, malleability. It's nice to look at and it's pretty. Uh, that's not a big part of the case, but you know, it's, it's a nice sort of benefit. But above all, what gold really has is uh, longevity. It has been money good throughout the entire history of civilization. Now, it wasn't always coined and used as money, but it has always had valuable, uh, a value. It's always been considered uh, a source of wealth. The, uh, the uh, sources are historical, uh, they're biblical, archaeological. Um, I don't think we need to spend a lot of time on that. I think that's fairly, um, fairly evident. Um, people say that there's not enough gold to support finance and world trade. That's, that's a sort of a risible objection. There's always enough gold. It's a question of price. Uh, there may not be enough gold at $1,200 an ounce, but there's plenty of gold at $10,000 an ounce. That was part of the presentation I did earlier. So there's always enough gold. You just have to get the, the price right if you're trying to, uh, trying to support um, uh, money supply. Um, and the last point I would make, and we're going to have some time for, uh, for rebuttals, but um, you can have um, discretionary monetary policy combined with a gold standard. People say, well, if we have a, if we have a gold standard, and there's a financial panic or a crisis or a depression, and you need to create money, what are you going to do? There's only so much gold. You're sort of feeding the deflation. We talked a little bit about that. Well, you can have a gold standard, gold-backed money, and a discretionary monetary policy side by side. But what you have to do is hold your feet to the fire in terms of monetary policy by conducting open market operations of gold. You have to be willing to stand up to the market. So let's say you want to set the price of gold at $5,000 an ounce. What a central bank has to do in that world is not just dictate that, but actually say, okay, gold is $5,000 an ounce. I am a seller and a buyer. I'm a buyer at $49.95 and a seller at $50.50. And if you think gold is cheap, come and get it. We'll, we'll ship it to you, you know, right out of Fort Knox. If you think gold is expensive, drop off your gold. We'll give you some money. So you have to stand up to the marketplace. So now you've got this financial panic. You want to print a lot of money to ease the situation. You can do that. But you'll find out very quickly by people's behavior whether they believe you or not. If that's good policy and people support it, they will not come down and buy all your gold. They'll say, you're doing the right thing. If you're abusing the privilege, if you're uh, trying to create inflation, if you're trying to destroy wealth, if you're trying to steal savings, then people won't trust you and they'll say, yes, I'll take the gold, thank you very much. So, so that way, that's how open market operations combined with discretionary monetary policy can work side by side using price signals, which is a very Austrian concept, to tell you, to guide your monetary policy, to tell you if you're on the right track or not. So just to summarize, uh, it's got it's uniform grade, it's atomic element, it's malleable, it's dense, it's got a long historical track record, it's flexible, um, and uh, at the end of the day, it's tangible. If you have physical gold in your possession, you have money that does not rely on any degree of trust. If you have it in a bank, you're trusting the bank. If you have it in GLD form, you have it on a COMEX future, you're trusting exchange, you're trusting some other party. But if you have physical gold in your possession, you didn't lose the leverage to buy it so the bank can't come and take it away, uh, that's money with no element of trust of any third party. It's the ultimate form of money and the foundation of all other kinds of money. So well, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs>
So, uh, I believe in gold. I own a little bit of gold. <laughs> <laughs> but I'm going to live up to my responsibility and uh, try to tell you why Bitcoin is better. But I think they're both great. Um, um, I'm, what, first, I'm going to argue about um, uh, physical gold and then comment on electronic representations of gold. Um, and when I argue about physical gold, I'm reminded of a joke that was told by uh, Guido Holzman, who, who many of you know, at an economics conference that I attended. And uh, the joke involves an economist, a physicist, and a chemist washed up on some desert island with a can of beans. And the physicist said, let's smash it open. And the chemist says, uh, no, let's heat it until it pops open. And the economist says, no, no, I have a better idea. Let's assume we have a can opener. <laughs> So, so I think uh, the, argument, the argument for physical gold uh, has a similar assumption embedded in it. It kind of assumes that, that we have a, a free market for money and that you know, if you want to just go and trade these gold tokens or if you want to take them across borders or, or do whatever, you know, use them however you want without anyone's permission, that that will be allowed. <laughs> but it's not allowed. Uh, Bitcoin is very much a, a reaction to the state and the state's impositions on, on money um, and, and Bitcoin's advantages over physical gold to, to me seem, seem fairly obvious. Uh, you can transport it anywhere in the world uh, almost instantly for free. Um, it's easier to, to verify it. There have never been fraudulent Bitcoins. Uh, it's more divisible. You know, if you're, if you're stuck with a, you know, I have a one ounce gold coins, you know, I'd, I'd have to buy, I'd have to have some intermediate money, like maybe I would trade it for a whole bunch of cigarettes and they'll deal with the cigarettes when I want to buy coffee for gold, but Bitcoin lends itself perfectly. Every Bitcoin is, is divisible down to eight decimal places. Um, and, uh, and we heard that, that physical gold requires no trust, sort of. I mean, you, you're, trusting, you're, trusting, uh, you're trusting society against you know, physical aggressions against your property. Or is uh, it's easier to hide Bitcoin than it than it is to hide gold, and it's easier to transport Bitcoin than it is to, to transport gold. So so in, in some in some ways, uh, Bitcoin requires less trust than physical gold. But I think the the more interesting comparison is to talk about electronic representations of gold, which have existed in the past, uh, back when entrepreneurs were allowed to do them. And I think the, the biggest uh, rival to Bitcoin will come, I, I hope it comes in, in my lifetime, but it'll come when the fiat system is, is dead and buried and entrepreneurs aren't afraid of engineering gold to behave like Bitcoin. Um, then you can have, then you can do with gold everything that you do with Bitcoin from the user's point of view. You could send it across boundaries for free and trust that some company is just keeping the accounts accurate in a vault somewhere far away. Um, this is how e-gold functioned um, before all their gold was seized. It was one of the largest seizures of physical gold ever. Um, but, uh, but even then, even then uh, there is still a case to be made for Bitcoin because, you know, I don't know if their e-gold's vaults were in Costa Rica or somewhere in the United States. I don't know where they kept it but that's still a physical risk of someone coming in and taking the gold. No such risks exist with Bitcoin. Um, you're still trusting a third party if you use electronic gold, whereas Bitcoin is person to person, no third party whatsoever. Uh, E-gold had an annual, annual peak of about, uh, or had a, in, their, in their decade, in their decade of existence, the most annual transactions were about a billion. And that was right before they were shut down. Bitcoin is already doing 200 million a day. So if you, if you add that up, it comes out to like 7 trillion something. So would somebody trust a, a business, a electronic gold business enough that they would build additional software and internet infrastructure to support the exchange of their currency? Uh, Bitcoin is a protocol and it has no owner and that's very attractive to software developers and I think that's why there's so much more action on Bitcoin than there ever was with eGold. Um, relying on that third party also creates the potential for uh, a Google Reader problem. 
a Google reader was a very popular reader that, that people would get their news from, but it belonged to Google and one day de they decided they wouldn't support it anymore and they shut it down. You know, why would uh, programmers, why would programmers build infrastructure on top of the next eGold when it's controlled by someone? I'm not saying they won't. I'm just saying that even in such a situation, there's still a case to be made for Bitcoin, which would not belong to anybody and which would be peer-to-peer -peer with no trusted third parties. Uh, last point I want to make. Um, you believe, most of us believe, or at one point believe that, that money should be a commodity. But I think even more fundamentally, we believe that markets choose their money. Markets choose their money. And I think when we, when we see the flight from the dollar, that network effect that we saw you know, in, the, in the earlier presentation, I think the door is wide open for Bitcoin in a way that it is not open for gold. I don't know of any restaurants that accept gold. I don't know of, of any place where you could buy electronics for gold. Um, there's a libertarian conference that happens every year in New Hampshire called Porkfest. Uh, and they, they really try to live uh, absent the state. And with that in mind, they used to trade in silver. Their, their little bazaar that they set up. This is a very small anecdotal example, and I may be guilty of a confirmation bias, but they had a little market at this conference every year where they traded in silver. This past year, no silver whatsoever. It was all in Bitcoin. So I'll leave it at that for now. We'll do a few minutes of rebuttal and then back over to Roman for the, uh, for the last word. So this uh, conference is called Intellectual Minds, which implies a certain broad-mindedness or open-mindedness. And I think um, Roman is definitely a lot more open-minded than I am because he said he owns gold and bitcoins, and I own gold. Uh, so he's, uh, I think, a little more uh, forward-leaning in that regard. Um, a couple things about uh, bitcoin specifically. Uh, one thing that's overlooked is that, uh, can big, is Bitcoin a form of money? Sure. Is it a, a kind of money? I, I don't dispute that. Uh, but it's not state money. And here we have to go back to the state money theory, which has uh, really evolved in Germany in the uh, early 1920s, uh, later called chartalism. Uh, today runs under the banner of modern monetary theory. But it says that money derives its uh, value from the fact that the state can require it uh, in the form of taxes under pain of death in the extreme case. And so uh, the problem with Bitcoin is if you buy your Bitcoins for $100 equivalent and you cash them in or exchange them for $200 of goods and services under certainly US tax code in UK and I think most countries, you have a $100 gain in that example. You bought the Bitcoin for 100, you swapped it for something that was worth 200, you have a $100 gain, leave aside whether that's ordinary income or capital gain, you have to put that on your tax return and you have to pay dollar taxes on the game. I dare say that there are practically no Bitcoin users in the world, exception of Roman, who are actually tax compliant, who are actually doing this on their tax returns, um, which means that all the Bitcoin users are tax evaders, uh, which is a felony in most jurisdictions. Uh, for people who don't think that the government's watching, I would refer them to a gentleman named uh, Snowden, I think now residing in Russia, who has told us enough about the NSA capabilities and their encryption capabilities and decryption capabilities. Um, we also have an IRS scandal in the US which shows that the IRS has been perverted to do selective politically based enforcement. So I think what's going on is that between the NSA and the IRS and organs of the US government and the Inland Revenue and uh, um, your uh, general headquarters, I think is what they call the uh, our equivalent of the NSA, are watching all this. And uh, someday, sooner than later, uh, hundreds of thousands of people, if not millions of people around the world, are going to get deficiency notices from the tax authorities saying, we've observed the following transactions. We've also observed that you didn't put this on your tax return. Um, you know, come in and give us an explanation. Of course, you're all felons at that point. Uh, and if you happen to be on the wrong side of the political divide, you might be subject to uh, incarceration. So that's coming. Uh, just kind of put that down as a warning and one reason to think hard about, um, about Bitcoin. Um, I'm actually very serious when I say that. Um, the other thing is that uh, uh, the, um, I talked about anything being a form of money. By the way, um, 
We're all familiar with, uh, with what's called the straw man argument, where you create a straw man so you can go knock it down and say, see, I knocked down that straw man. Uh, I thought it was interesting that Roman spent two thirds of his time talking about the deficiencies of e-gold. I never mentioned e-gold. I don't advocate e-gold. Uh, Roman basically put up a straw man that he attacked. I'm not talking about e-gold. I'm not talking about COMEX futures. I'm not talking about GLD. I'm not talking about ETFs. I'm talking about gold. So gold is no one's liability. I think no one's done a better job than the Austrians of pointing that out. It's the only form of money that's not a liability. You say, what's a dollar or a pound sterling? Uh, you know, I learned in the first week of law school, if you have a contract, you're supposed to read the contract. Take a, uh, take a again, I'm familiar with dollars, take a dollar bill out of your wallet, or take a pound sterling, and look at what it says. Look at the writing, that's the contract. It says it's a note. It's a Bank of England note, or in the case of US dollars, a Federal Reserve note. Where I went to law school, a note is a liability. Indeed, if you look at the balance sheet of a central bank, the money that they've created is listed on the liability side of the balance sheet. So it has no interest and has no maturity, uh, but you can think of money as a, perpetu a perpetual non-interest bearing liability of a central bank, and these days the central banks are actually insolvent. So there, the amount of trust in using that as a form of money is extremely high. And the reason clamshells and feathers and other media of exchange were accepted as money was because others in the system trusted that they had value. I would take a clamshell as money because I trusted that when I wanted to spend it, somebody else would take the clamshell as well. That works fine in, in communities. It works fine in tribes. It works fine on a limited scale where the trust is high. But the minute you broaden the community so that you're no longer in direct contact with people, you're relying on a degree of trust that may be misplaced. So Bitcoin is really a, a global community at this stage. I expect that will grow. Uh, but you're trusting uh, um, Sakimoto, whether he was an individual or a team, uh, whether he was working for Google, we're not quite sure, but uh, the creators of Bitcoin, uh, you know, we don't know that there aren't uh, you know, so-called trapdoors or hidden uh, aspects of the code. In open source, you probably ferret that out sooner or later. Uh, but finally, the, the ultimate trust is that um, when, when will you want your money the most? Let's call it your store of wealth, and let's refer specifically to gold. When will you want it the most? You'll want it the most when society is at its worst. In other words, if things are good, uh, f somehow the Fed stops printing money and the dollar stabilizes. By the way, I'm often labeled as a gold bug. I'm actually not a gold bug. I spend a lot of time reading and writing, researching and talking about gold. Uh, I'm a bit of an old school imperialist. I favor a strong dollar, the so-called king dollar policy. The problem is that's not what we have. Uh, I may favor it, but my, my preference is irrelevant. The policy of the United States is to weaken the dollar. That's why I, I lean to gold. But um, at the end of the day, uh, if society actually collapses, uh, your gold will be money good. And by the way, there's a role for silver as well, not to change it up, but that's an answer to the denomination problem. I recommend people have a what we call a monster box, 501 ounce American silver eagles. So you can think of silver as fractional gold, so you don't have to sit there with a, a file and kind of chip off little pieces of your gold coins. I agree that a gold coin in that world is probably a year's worth of groceries, not a week's worth of groceries. Uh, so there might be a role for silver there. But at the end of the day, uh, you don't have to trust anyone to find your value in gold. Uh, and Roman talked about Bitcoin being kind of outside the power of the state. That really is wishful thinking. The state is watching. They're waiting for you. They control the portals. Uh, you probably, if you're a Bitcoin user, you're probably a tax evader. And last time I checked, the uh, uh, last time I checked, the uh, the state runs the power grid. And uh, good luck with your bitcoins when the power goes out. <laughs>
the state sort of limited the legal usage of Bitcoin. So it, it has a huge uh, impact, but uh, I think it's just a question of whether it's going to be a, a, a white market or a black gray market. And certainly if the dollar starts to go, you know, it, you want to be in the black gray market. Um, I mean, just to, to pay the, you know, inflation, like if, if there is serious inflation, your taxes will go through the roof because if you buy something for a day and sell it tomorrow, it'll, it will have doubled in price. So, so it's not irrelevant, but I think it is outside the control of the state. Um, what they do now is, is uh, they watch the exchanges. I buy my Bitcoins, uh, the most recent ones, on an American exchange where I'm registered with my name and bank account, and I have warned my accountant that I will be uh, uh, about all that. But the, those are just the choke points into and out of the Bitcoin system. And because the choke points are guarded, um, most people want to stay in, in Bitcoin because they don't want to pass through those choke points again. They want Bitcoin so they can exchange without, without having to ask the permission of any bank, without the approval of any state. Um, and I think that's why it's going to spread. There was one more thing. Power. Oh, right. Well, I think without power, the, you know, the legacy, what I like to call the legacy banking system, maybe that's wishful thinking, but I think without power, the, the legacy banking system will, will be out, out of luck just as much as Bitcoin. And when the power comes back on, the, the blockchain is still there. So I wouldn't worry about that. And, uh, and I think that that's, that's mostly it. I mean, I guess the, the amount of time I spent on, uh, on e-gold was just because I thought the advantages over physical gold were, were fairly obvious, more transportable, um, you know, more verifiable, more divisible. Um, maybe we should want to take questions now. Maybe that will trigger some more good discussions. Okay. So, so maybe please uh, ask which one of us should, should answer the question. And, uh, and then ask the question, and we'll share the mic. Yes, sir. Thank you. Um, <clears throat> hopefully you'll be able to enlighten me just on a question I have. First of all, as many of you will know, uh, Carl Menger wrote a book on the origin of money, and he, in, in his theory, which Mises then built upon, was that money has to have its origin in the marketplace, as two important words, <laughs> as a consumer good. So both of these two words are important. Consumer, as in it is purchased for a reason in and of itself. So all the different types of money in history are a consumer good, gold, it was worn as jewelry, but also as a good. And Menger also defines good as having four characteristics, the most important of which is scarcity. So I have a question with regards the scarcity of this digital currency. Not that we all understand that it is mined and it is released at a certain period of time, but the fact that the what makes Bitcoin um, scarce is its uniqueness, and that it's, it was the first digital currency to be released as far as I'm aware. But what is stopping multiple other new digital currencies being created? Okay. Um, well, you don't have infinitely many, but there are uh, hundreds. I think there's around two or three hundred alternatives to Bitcoin. They're collectively known as altcoins, uh, and they've been a great playground for experimentation. Uh, one of the funniest ones is called Frycoin, which I call Keynesian coins, uh, because its creator had the idea that you need to spend your money or else it's bad for the economy. So they depreciate in value if you hold on to them too long. Uh, <laughs> Others, others are tied up with, uh, one can be a new, uh, a new protocol for the ownership of domain names. There's one called Namecoin. Uh, right now, if, uh, you know, say the, the government wants to seize the domain property and freedom society.org, um, if, uh, if those, if, the, if it was property and freedom society.bit, and it, it's, it's the ownership of the domains was regulated by Namecoin, they would be non-seizable. 
Uh, another one is, uh, is called PrimeCoin, and in their mining algorithms, they do something that's potentially useful for mathematics. They generate very big prime numbers for the ma mathematicians to play with. Okay, I'm getting off on a tangent just because I love this topic. Uh, well, a scarcity. Okay, um, right, and Menger. Okay, so scarcity. I think uh, there are many metaphors for, for Bitcoin. I think one of the best ones is a big ledger, and you're renting space in this ledger. So uh, it's not scarcity in the commodity sense, but it's, it's maybe scarcity in, in the service sense. And I think if you wanted to make things like, the, uh, like Mises' regression, uh, regression theorem work with Bitcoin, you have to do a little bit of, of gymnastics and argue that it's a service and not a commodity. And it's a service that predates Bitcoin. You know, before Bitcoin came on the scene, I paid uh, $30 for wire transfers from one country to another, or I, I paid a, um, what is it, a two point something percent for PayPal transactions, or credit cards take their percentage. So, so a demand for this service does predate the existence of Bitcoin. And then Bitcoin arrives, think of it not as a coin, but as a ledger, and you rent space in this ledger in order to use it for the sending of money. And I think that's the best way to square Bitcoin with, with Mises and Menger. But I'm also not sure if that, how valuable an exercise that is, because they were very much engaged in, in you know, untangling all the mediums of exchange of their day, which is why I, I think the colloquial definition of money is best. Thank, just, just to add uh, to what Rama says, I actually think Bitcoin passes the scarcity test maybe too well because it has a limit. Is it 24 million? Is the I think it's around 21 million. 21 million or so Bitcoin. The way the algorithm is set up, that you, you won't be able to produce any more after that. Now, the problem with that is it's highly uh, deflationary if you measure the price of goods in Bitcoin. In other words, if you cap out the amount of Bitcoin but the economy continues to grow, the value of a Bitcoin will go up uh, enormously. So eventually, you know, in the extreme, one Bitcoin would be able to buy an entire country with it because the economy would have grown to the point where, you know, the, the Bitcoins are fixed. So they may have to solve that problem, but it gets back to the community that Roman described. A lot of people object to the gold standard, and I would distinguish a gold standard from gold because gold is just money, and if you have it, you have money, you have a store of wealth. But a gold standard is this is a system where you take a paper chit, you know, in effect a, a warehouse receipt, but probably not that good, that's fixed to gold. So there's gold in the vault, and we circulate paper, and the paper has some fixed relationship to the gold, and you trust that. But the history is that countries abuse the trust. They periodically devalue the currency, uh, they'll uh, confiscate the gold, they'll do various things to break that trust, and that's happened over, over again. That's an objection to a gold standard. It's a valid objection. But you have the same objection with regard to Bitcoin. There's nothing stopping the Bitcoin community from getting together, you know, online or in cyberspace and consensually saying, you know, 21 million is too low. We really ought to have 40 million Bitcoin because that's more practical. So that could happen. It's not happening yet because we're not at that limit. But these are the kind of things when, it, when I say you have to trust the community and trust the evolution, trust the power grid, trust governments. There's a lot of trust of people you don't know that go into Bitcoin, and one of my reservations is, I mean, I'm not a Bitcoin hater. I, I'm, I'm, uh, I've read the papers, I've read the papers Roman has, I'm familiar with it. I, I think the technology's cool, the encryption's cool, I like open source. Uh, so I say go for it. I don't own any, I don't recommend it to clients, um, partly because it doesn't have the kind of track record that I look for when I want to allocate wealth. Uh, let me just a add to that briefly. Uh, the, the, um uh, deflation problem, if you consider it a problem, is actually made worse by losses of bitcoins. You can search for losses of bitcoins and read some painful stories about people who had hundreds of thousands of bitcoins and either threw away a computer or or uh, lost their their wallets or something like that. So it's actually worse. But with each one divisible down to 100 million pieces, uh, I don't think that's a problem. And uh, would the community support the changing of the protocol to expand to 40 million or 80 million? Uh, they would. They they would not if it would cheapen the bitcoins they currently own. But if it was if the if it was a problem and people were abandoning bitcoin altogether, then they would choose that to save the value of their coins. But that's a long way away. Uh, yes, sir, David.
<laughs> well, if you, uh, if you buy gold at a level and you exchange it for goods and services at a different level, you have to put that on your tax return. Uh, that's not what people do. What they do, <laughs> no, 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 what, what they do is they, I don't mean they don't report on a tax return. What they do is you buy gold for dollars, uh, and then when you, if you need dollars, you sell the gold for dollars and use the dollars to pay your bills. And yeah, that's, that's the taxable gain. You put that on your tax return. So it, I don't think it's any, any magic there. It's no different than buying IBM at 100 and selling it at 200. You have a $100 gain, so. Um, <coughs> there's probably some tax evasion in, uh, you know, across the board, but I think uh, gold is, uh, you know, you're in and out of the dollar system. It's, uh, let me put it this way. There are very few people evading taxes in gold who don't know what they're doing. I think the problem with Bitcoin is a lot of people just haven't thought about the problem. The, in my experience, the followers of Bitcoin are libertarians and technophiles, not necessarily economists or traders. And so I, I think in a lot of cases, it's just naivete. They can't put us all in jail. <laughs> yes, sir. I have a question for uh, Rohan in relation to what the gentleman said in uh, the article of the American theory of capital and uh, currency. In your opinion, it's a twofold question. In your opinion, is exchange a consumer good in terms of an opportunity cost? And uh, do you think that Bitcoin, in your opinion, is a consumer or a producer good? Um, can you help me with the difference between consumer and producer good? Well, a, that's why I ask you if you think a, a exchange is a consumption good and opportunity cost, because a producer good is a, a higher order good used for a final consumption good, for the uh, everyday, you know, uh, oh. uh, perishable. Yeah. Uh, well, I, I, that's a good question. Um, the, the service, I would classify it the same as the, the service of money transmission. Um, so however you would put that. I actually, I, I, I don't know, I, I would love to defer to our Austrian scholars in the room uh, on that question, but I don't know. Uh, you did re remind me of an earlier point, if you allow me to escape from that question. <laughs> uh, uh, you mentioned Menger's definition of money being a good that exists on the market, yes. and I was very happy to hear that because um, I didn't know that he used those words. Because when Mises describes it, he uses the word physical commodity, so that spoils it right there. But uh, I'm, I'm glad that Menger just said a good that exists on the market because then if you want to do the men mental gymnastics, you can say that it's, uh, it's packaging a service as a money. But I still think this is maybe not a very important game because we're, we're dealing with archaic definitions. More questions? Oh. This is a, this is a tough crowd to take issue with uh, Austrian tenants, but uh, I, I would suggest that there are things in the world other than producer and consumer goods. Uh, and one of them is the rule of law. Uh, and the rule of law is civilization's alternative to violence. In other words, absent the rule of law, through, through most of history, wealth was created at a very, very slow pace. Uh, a little bit here and there, some from trade, some from you know, mining and, and agriculture, but wealth grew very slowly. The way you got a lot of wealth was, was through violence. You, uh, you, know, uh, uh, you know, 30 years war, uh, crusades, uh, uh, nightly uh, combat, um, you know, the Norman invasion, you name it, but the way you got wealth, Vikings, raids, the way you got wealth is by stealing it from other people and killing them in the process. Um, it was only really with the Industrial Revolution that we got better at creating wealth as opposed to stealing wealth. But part of that evolution on and off is the rule of law. I would put money, uh, my definition of money would be a contractualism theory rather than Austrian theory or monetarist theory or chartalism, which is the state power of money. Uh, I would advance a contractual theory, which is really a subset of law, and saying that money is part of a rule of law, one of the ways that societies facilitate commerce and wealth creation without violence. And in that regard, Bitcoin is a form of money. Yes, sir. Yeah, everything about Bitcoin is 
it's code and any any good programmer can go and read all of it so at this point I will say that there are no secrets in the Bitcoin code there are no back doors um, like it could be that some guy with a, a gigantic brain is going to figure out how to crack elliptic curve cryptography but this is like that's some serious like you know scholarly work to to break that kind of cryptography but even then the blockchain still exists we know who owns who own what bitcoins so at worst it's a disruption and they'll switch to a different type of cryptography but those are you know the types of crypto used in bitcoin that they've been under academic scrutiny for for decades yes, how can somebody um, stop it from being counterfeited from being recreated Oh, okay. By by b counterfeiting, uh, it seems like you're referring to making a Bitcoin two that does the same thing in parallel. Those already exist. There are hundreds of uh, of those. But within the Bitcoin system, nobody has ever sent the same Bitcoin <coughs> twice and had it accepted. Yeah. So that when when we when I was talking about counterfeiting and and better v uh, verifiability than gold, that's what I meant. Within the ledger that is Bitcoin. Nobody has ever made fraudulent transactions or sent bitcoins they didn't own or anything like that. Other questions? Great, thank you for your attention.